So, Mr. John, um, <laughs> you, you, you've been, again, this platform, you, you, this, you're not a stranger. Um, you know, you've, you've been here. I remember last year, um, you made a couple of predictions, you know, with your background in foreign policy, oh. as a foreign policy. You made, you, I always refer to that, you know, when we I held forgot, this last year. I forgot year, about that. No, 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 I won't forget. You made some incredible predictions. You talked about who, who, who is likely to be the next president of the US. You also talked about um, Kamala Harris being a winning peak because back then, we, October of last year, all of this, we were all still watching the game and your pre predictions were spot on. So let me, let me really do the honors. Uh, Mr. John Rosenberg is a Washington lobbyist, um, advisor um, and partner at the Rosling Group. As a long-term serving international affairs consultant, um, government relations professional and communication practitioner, Mr. John possesses an in-depth knowledge of global security and international relations, exceedingly um, adept at the bridging different culture, um, and he counsels foreign interests in their ever crucial relations with United States. In addition, Who wrote that? <laughs> John. <laughs> Let me do the honors, John. You just wait. <laughs> you know, I like to say, you know, John has been to places people don't want to know. You've served in the Pentagon, correct, John? You can. Correct. Sometimes you're, you're really, really like just he's been very extremely humble. He doesn't want me to, to call it out. So, OK, OK. But John is the real deal. He's, he's, he advises um, U.S. government and African government on U.S.-Africa trade is the real deal. And I've asked him to help me moderate the panel today. Now, let me bring on, let me also introduce um, his fellow panelists quickly. Um, let me do that quickly. I have their profiles. I just need to switch that way I can. Okay. Mr. Daniel Mr. Dan Gabriel is a senior communications and geopolitical strategist. And as a leader in geopolitical analysis and strategy and business development, and also international affairs, he has worked over two decades for public, both public and private sector clients. For the last 12 years, Mr. Graber has been based in Geneva, Switzerland, as an expert advisor at the forefront of the convergence of African geopolitics, international finance, public relations, and government relations. He also advises governments and multinational organizations across various sectors, including telecoms, media, security, um, construction, and extractive industry. Just an honor to have you, Daniel. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. And finally, on the same panel is Professor Joseph Mbele. He's Professor um, of Postcolonial Literature and Folklore at St. Olaf. College in Minnesota. Um, he's originally from Tanzania, correct, Professor? Yeah. And um, with previous teaching experience at the University of Ta Dar es Salaam and Burundi, he's founder of Afri Connection Cultural Consultants, which provides cultural orientation to Africans and Americans. I'm going to stop there because you guys are going to have the next hour to educate us about what you do um, within African affairs policy relations and a blend of culture, understanding the cultural differences. Um, Professor Mbele, if I can also say, is the author of the book, um, Africans and Americans Embracing Cultural Differences. And I encourage everybody to go grab a copy. I'm telling you, if you want to deal with um, trade with Africa, it's a, it's, a, it's a recommendation from me. So over to you, Mr. John, you have the floor. Let me stop sharing. John. Yeah, there I am. We have... Uh... You've probably read in the news, but the trillions of cicadas that have come up here every 17 years, and they're out right now. I don't know if you can hear them in the background, but uh, yeah, they're all over the place here. You're fine. Northern You're Virginia fine. and up the East Coast. But uh, yeah, uh, good to be back again. I think it's only been about a month since I was on. So I want to kind of retreat more into the background and let my two other panelists kind of run with it today, let them shine. But uh, over this past month, there have been a few things that have occurred here in Washington. I would like to do a quick update on those. 
just just to uh, maintain the continuity here. But um, now, my girlfriend has been taking Toastmasters, and she was criticizing my past appearances on here, saying I don't look into the camera enough, and I'm looking around all the time, uh, like like the last panelist was doing, looking straight ahead, but. Uh, I've taken some notes here that I'll quickly go through and then kind of turn it over to my other two. But today is all about education. And I was thinking about that earlier. Uh, lobbying is really educating. That's what it's about. People think lobbying is about backroom deals with cigars and drinking scotch. And, okay, there's a bit of that. Uh, they think it's about spinning news stories. Okay, there might be a bit of that, but it's mostly about educating decision makers here in Washington about your needs, about what a certain country is looking for, what they want. It might be help with uh, visa matters. It could be military training. It could be any number of things, but it's about educating in ways that uh, your embassies here cannot do. And likewise, it's about uh, educating you on Washington and how things work. And uh, it's uh, the process of making laws and legislation is what was said half a century ago or more. It's like making sausages. It's not for the, the faint of heart. It's a complicated process. But And then the second half of, lob of uh, not lobbying, but education here today will be the professor and Daniel and myself somewhat talking about educating on how cultures, different cultures work and how to approach them and the do's and don'ts. And we can also take it back this way, the do's and don'ts and dealing with Washington, dealing with Americans. So that's what we're looking for today. But I promise you, I'll just quickly here go through uh, some changes that have occurred since the last time I was on about a month ago. And uh, we've done a couple of things in terms of personnel, kind of inside baseball stuff to you, perhaps, but still quite relevant. And I think one of the biggest ones, and Daniel and I had a conversation with him just, uh, I think, last week. Uh, so Dennis Matanda is his name. Uh, Representative Karen Bass of the House of Representatives. She heads the Africa subcommittee. Uh, this Dennis Matanda will now serve as her new uh, top staff person. And I'm really excited about him in this position. He's someone that you should really follow. Uh, he does not come from a political background, which I find intriguing. He actually comes from uh, the topic of this uh, summit, uh, trade and negotiations. He's worked uh, the AGOA issues. He's been working on the Africa Free Trade Agreement. Uh, zone. Uh, he, and he's worked in private equity quite a lot, investment in African financial institutions. So I, I know I've met him in the past in passing, but we had a very fine conversation about a week ago, and I'm really excited to see him in this role. And Daniel, do you have your mic on? If he's there. I just thought he could say a quick something. In that regard, too, but uh, a second person who has now come into office uh, a month ago when it was last year, she was not yet approved by the Senate, is Samantha Power, now of USAID. She's in her position, and she should be a major player in African policy. You know, I heard someone yesterday, one of the panelists, talking about NCC here and how 70% of their compacts go to African countries. Well, it's sort of the same with USAID. I don't know the exact percentage, but somewhere around 60, 70% of USAID activity is also Africa. So that means someone like uh, Samantha Power is gonna have considerable say on uh, how the US government interacts with the continent. So those are two from a personnel standpoint, things that uh, have changed since I last saw you all. And uh, Samantha Power has been taken up with COVID response, uh, vaccine, uh, vaccines and uh, Gaza has kind of taken up the time so far. But 
for the most part, Washington, as it was a month ago, is still focused primarily on the Ethiopia issue. You know, all this talk, Toyin and I get into this every time we, we talk either on the phone or I have I appear at one of these uh, events of hers. It's almost a chicken and egg thing. It's, it's nice to talk all the trade and investment and it will happen. But investors want security. And I'm always maintaining that political security and actual security is paramount. Uh, uh, you know, especially if you're going to get American investors interested in the U.S. has fallen off. And with all these events such as uh, Nigeria starting to fall apart again, uh, the Sahel has been on fire. It keeps getting worse and worse every week, every month. Ethiopia is hair raising the Horn of Africa, and I can go on. But uh, what attention is being paid to Africa is largely on those issues right there with the security and with Ethiopia and the like. Now, I'll just, I was, I was going to say a few more things about the National Security Council and the like, but I, again, I don't want to get too inside baseball with you today about what's going on in Washington, but uh, the action here is really in the House and the Senate. Those are the places to watch. That's where the best focus, the best attention, uh, the best policy solutions are originating is from the House and Senate. And uh, well, like I said, Representative Bass's office and Congressman Chris Smith, the Republican Congressman, uh, from New Jersey. That's where the best Africa analysis policy is coming from. And on the Senate side, oddly enough, it's not the, the chair people of the Africa subcommittees who traditionally carry the weight there, but it's the actual uh, head of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Menendez, and his counterpart, Senator Risch from Idaho, who also are taking up, leading the way when it comes to Darfur and to, to Gray, again, Ethiopia. And that's largely all I have to say for an update standpoint from uh, my appearance here a month ago. And we may want to segue now, if Daniel has anything more to add about uh, the, the security component I was just discussing. Are you there? Um, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, da Daniel's been with me in most of these meetings, so it's good to have him back in Washington after all these years in Geneva. So, yeah, he, he's been privy to all these conversations and insights that I've had this past uh, few months. I just thought that, John, maybe you can add a little bit to um, some of the things that happened last week. For example... The, uh, the Senate hearing that happened last week on Ethiopia. Um, if you can just add a little bit more on, for example, that most people don't know that when it comes to the importance of what kind of questions and what is being put on the floor there and the decisions made, uh, the, com the, composition of the, the composition of the committee and the fact that it's actually split 50-50 so it really, the decision actually comes down to a consensus between both groups because whether you're, you know, most people assume that because it's a Demo the Democrats are in power, that's going to take precedence and that's not the situation. And again, it's inside baseball, but it's very important in terms of what kind of decisions and what kind of direction these things take. And I was saying, I don't want to get too critical here, but you know, the White House came out with a statement on Ethiopia just the other day, but it was a, it was a usual rule of law talk. It was about our long-term ties with Ethiopia. It was, it was just the usual kind of statements. I don't really seem to say much. Now I'll get again, maybe a bit too inside baseball here, but you know, one of the, one of the shortcomings of the American government, and this didn't start no means under under um, President Biden, but so much of our foreign policy now is being run by special envoys. I mean, it's really getting out of control. Here, I actually made a list here last night. This is how many special envoys we have instead of just the diplomats 
the ambassadors and the like, the embassies doing their job. We have special envoys in Yemen, Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan, climate, Iran, uh, the Northern Triangle, which is Central America, where Secretary Blinken is this week. Uh, North Korea, Nord Stream, which is a giant Russian uh, gas project into Europe. Special envoy on passages on Libya, on nuclear proliferation, on Horn of Africa, on anti-Semitism, and on the Holocaust. And we sent Senator Chris Coons over to Ethiopia as a special envoy too. And frankly, not much is coming out of it. In fact, so little that when you try and contact the office to have a discussion with the senator, you can tell they just don't even want to talk about it. But yeah, you're right, Daniel. It's, it's a different dynamic in the Senate than it is the House right now because it really is 50, excuse me, 50-50. And one good thing about the House and the Senate when it comes to Foreign Affairs and the Armed Services Committee, and I've said this several times on Toyin's platform here, they generally work well together in harmony anyway. So yeah, I'm really happy that Capitol Hill has its act together when it comes to not just Africa, but foreign policy in general. And with that, uh, why don't we uh, turn to the professor, unless you have something more to say. Go ahead. Well, you were the one who actually watched the hearing on Ethiopia. I did not have the occasion to catch it. No. Let's, is the professor on? Do we have him? Yes. Can you hear me? He's yes. all dressed up for us, too. Well, yeah. For, and, the, first time, for the first time in my life. So. <laughs> You're the one who told us to be. Um, I know, but okay. I watched. I watched everybody else, and they are so formally dressed. You know, everybody's going to be surprised to see me this way. Everybody who knows me. But anyway, thank you very much, and um, I really want to thank Toyin for uh, inviting me. And um, um, I'm a teacher. I teach literature. I teach folklore. And uh, people might wonder, what am I doing in this conference? You know, people doing trade and business. And uh, I don't think I've ever sold anything in my life. So uh, <laughs> so what am I doing here? Um, Toyin has helped me to discover a, a dimension of myself that I think I can uh, develop by interacting with uh, this uh, kind of people that we have in this conference. And, and so I thank Toyin uh, Toy for being very, you know, um, firm about that and just putting me up here. Um, as a teacher of literature, I deal with people. As a teacher of folklore, I deal with people. People tell stories, you know, um, uh, the traditional storytellers, you know, folk tales and myths and legends, all the singers and what they tell us about human beings, human relations and values, our dreams, the challenges of life and relationships. Those are the things I deal with. And so coming into this kind of conversation and listening to everybody, uh, I hear people talking about goods and uh, commodities and services and markets and tariffs and rules and uh, taxes. And uh, uh, for me, as a literature person, my question is, uh, maybe we should be talking about the, the people, business, trade is something that's done by human beings. You know, the crops don't move by themselves from Africa to America. You know, um, uh, the goods don't make the decisions to travel across the oceans. It's human beings interacting with other human beings that make those things happen. So business is really about um, human relations. Trade is about human interactions. And that is the contribution I will be bringing to these uh, conversations. Uh, again, thanks to Toyin for bringing me in. Um, so my basic premise is this. My basic premise is very simple. 
when people of different cultures meet, when people of different cultures interact, I don't know, I don't care whether it's business, whether it's marriage, whether it's uh, research, as long as they are from different cultures, then the issue of cultural differences comes in and they have to deal with it from day one. So here we are talking about trade between Africans and Americans. And uh, we talk about, you know, exporters, we talk about partners, we talk about collaborators, we talk about customers, consumers. <clears throat> and in my way of thinking, these are not just consumers, these are not just producers, these are Africans on the one hand, and these are Americans on the other hand. And when they get together, uh, when they get together, and this is really something I want to emphasize here, when you put Africans and Americans together, uh, from the first minute, things begin to happen because of cultural differences. As time progresses, they might begin to be very suspicious of each other, very angry with each other. Uh, they might begin to see each other as a pain in the neck. Yes. You put Africans together with Americans, sooner or later, the Africans will become a pain in the neck of the Americans, and the Americans will become a pain in the neck of the Africans. So the book that Toyin mentioned that I wrote, Africans and Americans Embracing Cultural Differences. Toyin loves this book, and that's why she wants to mention it all the time. To cut a long story short, this book is about why Africans are a pain in the neck of the Americans, and why Americans are a pain in the neck of the Africans. I'm sorry, I'm using very blunt language here and I've not heard this language the last three days, but you know what, uh, bear with me, that's the way I talk and I'm trying to restrain myself very much today. As you can see, I'm very well dressed. I'm really trying to be a good boy. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so you have an American going to Africa to trade, okay? Uh, they are meeting Africans and they are in Burkina Faso. The American is in Burkina Faso or the America is in Tanzania, my country. And um, they begin to see the ways the Africans behave, the way they talk, the way they act. They begin to see, for example, you know, yeah, the way they talk, you know, they don't make eye contact. They are not very direct. Oh yes, Americans are very direct. You know, yes is yes, no is no. And uh, the Ethiopians, you know, beat about the bush. They don't say yes or no sometimes. Sometimes they will say yes when they actually mean no. Sometimes they will say no, but actually intending to say maybe or yes. And that's how they become a pain in the neck. Now, the problem is this, the problem is this. Um, the American will sit there and observe these things. And uh, for example, you know, the Africans are not on time. They talk about a meeting which starts at nine. The American will be there, the Africans are not there. And so the American will begin to get very anxious perhaps very angry and asking questions, you know, why are these people not punctual? Why are they not on time? These are the kinds of things I'm talking about. So talking about just time as an example, there is a chapter in my book, which is titled, Time Flies, but not in Africa. Think about that. Time flies, but not in Africa. The American will be there asking all kinds of questions. Why are, they why are they not punctual? Why don't they learn to be punctual? They said they would come at nine, they are not here. In fact, they all have watches. 
the American will be surprised. The Africans have watches on their hands and they are not on time. These are the kinds of issues that concern me. And there are many in the book. You uh, know, not Professor? Yes. You know, I was just thinking of another one that uh, occurred to me many, many years ago, decades ago, first starting to work with Africans is Africans will read their emails and just don't respond to the emails so often. And that's another frustration <laughs> that I've had. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then you come to the other side of the question. When Africans are here in the USA or when Africans are dealing with Americans now, so they've come all the way from Nigeria, then in Washington, D.C., or in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Los Angeles. For them, it's also a nightmare. Everything happens on time. Meetings start on time. The buses leave on time, and they have to run all over the place to be on time. And uh, that's the nightmare for the Africans, the way well, Americans do things. That's a nightmare for us. Well, Daniel, what about Africans in Geneva? I mean, Geneva makes the um, United States look laid back. I uh, Let me take it into another direction, if it's possible, with the professor. Um, I think it's th these cultural differences and um, uh, nuances, et cetera, are extremely important, of course, to understand each other so that misunderstandings don't take place. But um, if we can also take the similarities between cultures and how, I think we discussed this a bit yesterday with the professor, as to look at um, issues, for example, that affect, you know, we were talking about investors and we're talking about countries and politics and so on also. And um, for example, if we look at the similarities between culture in the Sahel region, or as we discussed yesterday in Southern Tanzania and North Mozambique, and how these similarities between the culture make it such that when you have a political pathogen, for example, in, in, in uh, to quote our friend, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ted Karasek, um, when you have a political pathogen as uh, uh, political Islam that invades and, and creates havoc and creates problems in the entire area and tremendous amount of losses as when we are seeing and witnessing now in Mozambique, how can you take those kinds of similarities between the cultures, between let's say Southern Tanzania and, and, and North Mozambique and turn it into something that actually works or even educate um, the corporations and the companies and Americans that come to that area to understand what they're dealing with. Uh, in terms of people. Uh, professor, you spoke about stories and dreams and so on. And people in those areas also have stories and dreams, uh, et cetera, yet they're dissatisfied and unhappy and, and, and manage to join these groups that create problems and create problems for, for the countries uh, internationally, et cetera. And what can be done about that? Okay, so um, the point I was, raising, and I'll get to your issue you know, in a minute. Uh, the point I was raising is this. I really want to see Africans as uh, people who share a lot in common. And uh, I think in some ways that touches on what you are saying. That's why I have the two groups, Africans on one side, Americans on another side. And I want to see interactions between two, those two groups. Uh, because there are differences, of course, within Africa, there are differences within America. But, but my focus is on the things that make Africans alike. And uh, I have the proof of this in the sense that uh, uh, the Africans who listen to me talking about those differences, uh, uh, for example, the way we handle time, it doesn't matter whether we are from Sierra Leone or Mozambique, or Egypt or Ethiopia. The way we communicate, it doesn't matter whether we're from Nigeria or Zimbabwe, those are the things that are used to just lump all the Africans together. And then with Americans, and I think my approach is very, very vital because when an American goes into Africa, no matter where, South Africa, Zimbabwe, 
Burkina Faso. I'm trying to tell them there are some common things they need to be aware of, which really cut across the continent. And uh, the things I've said, for example, about time. In Nigeria, they're never on time. In Egypt, they're never on time. I'm kidding, of course. I'm exaggerating. Uh, so it's helpful for the American to know you are going to invest in Botswana, you're going to invest in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Sierra Leone to shed your American expectations. And for the African, it's the same thing. You're going to America. It doesn't matter whether it's Michigan or Los Angeles. It's just good to know certain things. For example, for example, the issue of money how Americans conceptualize money, how they deal with money, how they handle money. Uh, this issue of punctuality, for example, if dinner is uh, said to be, you know, it, it will happen at nine, I mean, sorry, at seven, I need the Africans to know it doesn't matter whether it's New York, California, or New Mexico, you better be there at seven. And the American should know if Africans say there's a dinner at seven, it doesn't matter whether it is Sierra Leone or Kenya, it will not happen at seven. Or a wedding, it will not start at seven. I need to tell the Americans this, slow down, calm down, because the American will be there at seven and they don't see the Africans there. So there's just these kinds of common things and this is really my focus. So in my book and in my talks, I'm very careful to make sure that um, I let people know there is no better culture than another culture. I okay. talk about the American ways and I explain them, I validate them. I talk about the African ways, I validate them. So in my book, I'm not going to apologize to anybody for African time. I celebrate African time. At the same time, I understand the American concept of punctuality. I respect both cultures and I want everybody. You know what? The problem is this. We have been colonized. We were under, coloni we were, we were under colonizers who said all kinds of negative things about us. They told all kinds of bad stories about us. So the danger right now is this of neo-colonialism. We talk about trade, we talk about business relations. American companies will come to Africa and they will say, oh, you need to put this thing in place and these rules and these rules, and uh, you must you know, create an environment that's you know, good for business, those kinds of, you must exterminate corruption. They use the word corruption by simply sitting in Nigeria or in Ethiopia and observing the way things are done in Ethiopia, they misinterpret it. They say this is laziness, this is corruption, this is this and this is that. Those are the things I'm fighting against. And uh, Africans coming to America, they also make those kinds of judgments. They hear Americans talk. And the Africans will be offended. They will say, oh, these Americans are rude. These Americans don't respect us. No, 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 no. It's the way Americans talk. They're very direct. If What's an example of that? Uh-huh, please go, go ahead. No, what, what would be an example? Oh, well, yes. Americans will ask Africans to do something, okay? John, say you are in Nigeria and the Africans or in Kenya or in Tanzania, the Africans respect you very much. They've been told you are this, you know, very important man from Washington, D.C., and you are in Dar es Salaam, and you are asking them to do something. They're not going to tell you no. There are so many considerations of politeness, so many considerations of saving face. If you make a mistake in Dar es Salaam, John, they're not going to tell you directly there's the concept of saving face. We respect this man. We just can't tell him, no, that was wrong. We are not going to tell him, no. They will beat about the bush. They were not going to, they're not going to be direct with you. Those, that's oh. a clear example. How I mean, does this, it, it will take time. 
it will take time for you to figure out that they are actually trying to say no. Uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. How, um, I, I understand all of that, and I'm sure most of our people do. Most of the people who are watching also understand all of that. But if but we can relate, the question, the question is this: Do the Americans understand it? For Americans, this is a pain in the neck when the Africans are not being clear. Not unless they've lived overseas, because the, the Asian societies do the same thing. They will yeah. not tell you no. I've lived in China. Exactly. You have to live overseas. But an American who has lived in Kansas all their life, in rural South Dakota, they won't get it. But how does this affect decisions that are made that cost millions of dollars? Because in the end, it comes to a point of investment and it comes to a point of, of decisions made, whether to uh, make a loan available, whether to make money available, whether to invest in a country or not. How, exactly. does, it, how does that affect it? Because that's really exactly. where it's important. Exactly. And in, in case, for example, of whether you're investing in Ethiopia or Mozambique or Nigeria, do you think that misunderstanding these things will end up affecting the decision in a negative way or people mm -hmm. americans uh, grin and bear it and realize that that's the cost of doing business in this country and we move on because the investment is more important okay good question what i would like to happen what i would like to see happen and that's what i'm encouraging i like people to learn about each other so that they don't just have to put up with these things. Inwardly, you are complaining and you are saying, oh, these weird Africans. And yet in public, you just have to go on with the deal to the negotiations, but you are very miserable. And you don't really like being with those people because they are so weird. And the, and the Americans, the Africans, you know, they're talking with the Americans in the meeting and after the meeting, they go back to fellow Africans and say, oh, these weird Americans. And the Americans go back to, uh -huh. what I would like is for people to be really comfortable with each other. You go to the Americans and you really know their ways and you are okay with, I am that kind of person. I don't see Americans as weird at all. In fact, I like them because I know them. I anticipate their behavior. When something happens, I know what will happen. So that's the, the number one thing in response to your question. I don't want to people, people to live with these tensions. I want people to understand each other and embrace the differences. So when the American flies from Kansas City to Kaduna, you know, they are not bothered by the way the people in Nigeria talk. They understand. They and give then, them the time. You give them then, the time. Okay, go ahead. Then look internally here. You you are right now 30 miles away. What's that? 40, 50 kilometers away from where George Floyd was killed. Talk about miscommunications, misunderstandings, different cultures. You know, that's right here. That's right there in Minneapolis. So exactly. you, don't have, you don't have to go to Dar es Salaam to have, have misunderstanding. Exactly. So... Uh, the thing I'm pushing is this, <clears throat> the thing I'm pushing is this, to create mutual understanding so that when the American goes to Africa, for example, again, I'm talking about these generalizations. I'm looking at the Africans as one thing, and I'm looking at Americans as one thing. There are many risks in doing this, but I have compelling reasons for doing this. For take, Look here, the American writer, James Baldwin, an African-American writer, since you are talking about uh, George Floyd, African-American writer, James Baldwin, he left the US, went to live in France. And uh, when he was in the US, he just felt we are black people, we are different from the white Americans. You know, we will never be together, we'll never. That's what he was as a black man in America. He goes to Europe, he lives in Europe, and he writes this essay, he says on what it means on the discovery of what it means to be an American. You can Google that, on the discovery of what it means to be an American by James Baldwin. Here's what he says. He discovered when he was in Europe 
that he was just an American like any white American. Go to Google and type on the discovery of what it means to be an American. So I have this point that Americans are just Americans. They have their own differences, but those differences don't matter when they go abroad. If but you are in London, uh -huh. yeah. Professor, okay, we can take it into a different direction for a moment. We have a situation now um, in the entire continent uh, of Africa, whether we're talking about uh, Central, West, or even South, and, and even the Horn of Africa, where you have political situations where the United States government is going to need to make uh, decisions in terms of intervention, health, sustaining some governments, propping up others, uh, or deciding to abandon some others, for example, as to what happened in Mali. How, uh, what happened last week in Mali, how do uh, these attributes and, and, and these issues that you're bringing up as, as an American person making a decision on what's going on in Africa, for example. Yes, exactly. Um, how do you think uh, you can help them understand so that the decisions are made in such a way that helps rather than create a bigger problem. Because Great no matter question. what, the United States government and the United yes. States the country is yes. so powerful that it will make a decision on a lot of these places. Yes. Um, yes. And that, yes. those decisions made, like we discussed in the beginning, uh, when, when John discussed the Senate hearings, etc., affect millions of people. And if, if these decisions are made based uh, uh, made by Americans who, as you say, uh, might be misunderstanding the entire culture and the people, and in that case, many times amongst politicians will look at each other as liars and misleading yeah. each other and businessmen also, um, what can be done in order to fix that? Yes. Because we have situations yes. in the continent now yes. where Millions yes. of people are at risk, and you're saying yes. it's yes. based on misunderstanding. Yes, yes. Good question. Good question. And I can give you some very powerful example there. Uh, to cut a long story short, learning how to communicate with the Africans. Say Africans uh, in some place, like maybe like you, you mentioned, you know, Congo or someplace, something terrible is happening, and you are the American diplomat, you just need to know how to speak to them. It's very important. Oftentimes, when America speaks internationally, um, I get the feeling that there is a miscommunication, there is a misunderstanding. For example, for example, for example, during the Gulf War, before the Gulf War, you know, George Bush the first, mm -hmm. when he was mobilizing the coalition, yes. the coalition of the willing, that was the yeah. phrase. American diplomats are all over the Middle East and getting those governments to come on board to attack Saddam and all that. They come back to Washington DC and they announce, oh yeah, our allies are solidly behind us. And I was listening and looking at what the allies had said, I realized the Americans misconstrued what the allies say. As I said earlier, people outside the US might say something that appears to be yes, it's not actually yes. So Americans, because they speak so directly, they think yes means yes. Our, our allies are solidly behind us. It turned out they were not, because I remember some cases where those same allies stood out later, stood up later and said, no, 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 no. We didn't consent to this. Those are the moments when I, as a cultural consultant, feel I need to push this idea of learning how other people communicate. Americans should learn how we communicate. We should learn how Americans communicate, not take offense and not misinterpret. Let me give you an example now from Africa, from Africa, which directly addresses your question. There was the case of Zimbabwe and Mugabe. Yes. Uh, Mugabe was being portrayed all over the world as a dictator and dictator and dictator. He's nationalizing all the farms. He's so terrible. And Americans were saying to the Africans, why don't you do something about Mugabe? Why don't you do something? And the Africans were not doing anything. As a cultural consultant, I was very amused by that crisis. 
because from an African point of view, Mugabe is a very old man. He's like a grandpa. And who among the African leaders would dare to attack, to criticize an old man, a grandpa figure? So there was tension going on and I was really amused there. I knew the Americans would not achieve anything if they wanted, say, the president of Tanzania and his name at the time. I mean, the president was Jakaya Kikwete, a very young man, just about my age. Kikwete, Jakaya Kikwete was my age. We were in school together. You expect me to criticize Mugabe, a grandpa? No way, no way. So it didn't work. But the Americans were very adamant. Why don't the Africans do something about Mugabe? The Africans didn't do anything. There are those cultural values in Africa. You respect the elders. The elder is never wrong. Unfortunately, in our culture, it will take you a long time and a long process to make a point that the old man is wrong or the elder is wrong. It's very hard. That's one of the most difficult things for Africans to tell an old, old person that he or she is wrong. These are the things I'm talking about. Americans should have never tried to push those Africans, you know, to do something about Mugabe. The more they did it, the more the Africans resisted them. That answers your question in some ways. Well, up, up to a point, up to a point, because also Mugabe, I mean, I can see from the African perspective, Mugabe fought for liberation. He did all kinds of things. But I do agree with you. Uh, John and I have been in situations uh, before in front of presidents, etc., where their staff are afraid of saying anything to them or even correcting them or correcting their thinking, even though they were completely wrong. So we are sensitive to that um, and, and understand it. But at the same time, I think it's important that um, some of these ideas that you're making and, and, and some of these points that you're making um, translate into a situation where um, it can be applied in a way to help decision-making processes. Because, for example, what, you're, what you were talking about in terms of Mugabe um, and saying he's an old man, therefore we cannot correct him. Yes, but in the meantime, uh, thousands of people, millions of people are being affected by this grandpa who was affecting people in the wrong way. So something has to be done. And what is done and what is the way, let's say, culturally and sensitively to deal with it? Let's say you're, you're saying of what can't be done uh, because of the respect towards an old man and a grandpa and so on. Well, what can be done? Good question. You know what? You need to get an old man like President Kaunda. And that happened, I believe. You get yes, an old man, happened. a retired president, no longer president, but a very highly respected old man, Kenneth Kaunda. You, you try to persuade Kaunda to go talk to a fellow old man, Robert Mugabe. That's the way to do it. It was a mistake for Washington to expect the president of my country, a young man, to do something about Mugabe. It was wrong for Washington to expect a young Nigerian president to do something about Mugabe. Get the old African leaders, wherever they were, you know, retired presidents, they could be 90 years old. Obasan Joe was very good at that. Say that again. <laughs> Obasan Joe was very good at that. Exactly, and Obasan Joe is all over the continent now. He came to my country a few days ago. He's everywhere, and the Africans love that because he's an old man moving around the continent, sorting out these Africans. That's what we like in Africa. Good so, luck, John, good luck Jonathan was just in uh, Mali, but he's not uh -huh. that old, old, but yeah. You know. uh -huh. uh -huh. So uh -huh. if, if Washington can learn this kind of lesson, get the old Africans. You know, um, uh, so what you're uh, saying that is the, the, one of the ways of solving these problems is creating a delegation of retired old African leaders <laughs> to go to different countries and influence <laughs> those presidents in one way or another. That will resonate with the Africans. That will, if they ask my opinion, if the Americans keep asking me, now what do we do? There's this mess going on somewhere. Those are the kinds of things I will tell them. And you know what? The Americans will 
avoid being misunderstood in Africa. Because the danger now is this, Americans are, still, are seen as pushy, you know, they're bullying us, they're doing this and they're doing that. There are other ways of doing things. And so what I do, whether you're talking about international politics, whether you're talking about trade, whether you're talking about, as I said at the beginning, as long as it involves people of different cultures, you really have to be aware of the cultural differences, study them, and uh, take action accordingly. That was my first premise. Any relationship involving people of different cultures brings up this issue of cultural differences. So absolutely, you guys would, are into, uh -huh, go ahead. Would an old woman carry that same stature? Uh, absolutely. Joyce, Band, Joyce Banda, seen, uh, Alan Sirleaf. I, I have seen it in my village. And um, I mean, the, for the Africans, if you are the oldest in any gathering, you, you get that respect. It doesn't matter whether you are a woman or a man. As long as you can come out as the oldest. That's why when you ask Africans, you know, what is your age? When were you born? Uh, it's very embarrassing to end up being the youngest in the group because then everybody can send you on errands. They have <laughs> the right to send you on errands. You know, um, oh yes, if John and I were to meet and uh, when were you born? And I, I tell you I was born in 57, for example, which is not the case. And you end up uh, letting me know you were born in 1940. Oh my God. What this means now is you can tell me to go get your cigarettes. And you have the right and I'll run to get you your cigarettes. So for Africans, the age thing is very delicate. You know, there's no pride in being young. That's one of the culture shocks when you come to America. All Americans are striving to be young. You get these advertisements. Oh, there's this product here that will make you look 10 years younger. I tell my students at Central Love College, when I get those emails, I feel like writing them back and telling them, get me something that will make me look 10 years older, please. Okay. <laughs> um, let, let me ask you another thing, Professor, because now what we're seeing in terms of trade um, in, in Africa, there's a lot of inter-African trade. Um, and, uh, you know, there are many uh, Nigerian investors who are investing in energy fields in different parts of Africa, in Angola, in, in uh, Gabon, etc. I've seen it in myself. Um, I've, I've seen uh, uh, businessmen from uh, West Africa invest in Central Africa in mining. Uh, you and I discussed yesterday Aliko Dangote. Uh, investing in a huge cement factory in Southern Tanzania. What you're saying, and, and if, I take it, if I, I take what you're saying to its logical conclusion, therefore um, these businesses are in the direction to succeed because many of these African cultures are really very similar in many ways. Yes. And, and those similar, similarities will help trade in internally in in the continent itself, inter-African trade become even bigger as these uh, borders and, and, and all the different trade barriers are coming down as we see and we've been talking about. So maybe yes. we can talk a little bit more about that. And for example, the, the, this investment of Aliko Dangote in Southern Tanzania, which is a massive cement factory. Uh, what do you think about those things? And what do you think about an investment like that? And do you think it will be a successful investment? Will yeah. it make, make, make money? Will he be able to do what he needs to do there? Yeah. I uh, think, I think Toyin, we better stop after this one. Uh, I told you the time would go by quickly. Okay, okay. So the good thing about Africans is this, they've been trading for thousands or hundreds and hundreds of years. They've developed a protocol, about you know, how to do trade and so on. So it is easier for Africans to invest within African societies because there's so much you know, that they share in common. We have been trading for ages. Yesterday, Toyin talked about the market women, for example, uh, in West yeah. Africa. They have protocols. So when, when, when foreigners come into Africa and Americans, for example, uh, they, they shouldn't come with the idea that they're introducing trade to the Africans. 
when they come with conditions, do this, do this, create ease of doing business. There's ease of doing business in the market in Lagos. Okay, but what Americans call ease of doing business is very much American centered. The American way is easy for them, but is it easy for the Africans? So there should be negotiations on both sides when we meet. What should we do without these preconceptions? What should we do to create a proper environment for the American investor in Nigeria? There should be a conversation, not an imposition, you know. Um, uh, so this is really my, my core. There should always be negotiations, mutual understanding, and the, the learning process. We talked about education here. The moment you begin to invest in Nigeria as an American, you begin to learn about the culture. It should be a continuing process. There's always learning. The moment Americans, Africans come to sell things in America, they should begin to learn about America. It should be a continuous education on both sides. That's my message. Okay. John? But yet this measure, ease of doing business, uh, the three countries in Africa that always rank at the top are actually the most successful, Rwanda, Mauritius, and Botswana. Yes, and, but I, I agree with you, John, but because Rwanda is actually, adhere, actually adhering to the lines and following the directions of what it's being told in order to make itself a model of doing business or uh, a country as a model of ease of doing business. And it's following the roadmap and the blueprint that is given to it by the United States and the European Union. And that's why it was successful, but it's contrary to what the press professor was saying. It might not be the African way of doing things. Exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I don't want neo-colonialism, Africans being pushed the way we were pushed under colonialism. There has to be a way which respects African traditions. Africans have been trading since the ancient Egyptians and before. I stand for the African ways where there should be, look here, the Chinese are not pushing the Africans to do anything. The Chinese are trading in Africa. They are not pushing us. They accommodate the African ways. That is the model I like. Okay. John, okay. what do you say about that? <laughs> uh, uh... Someone, someone was on, uh, this Colonel Wyatt was on a Toyin, uh, Toyin's program here for, uh, two months ago. He spoke and I agreed with him completely. I do not like this idea of models in the first place when it comes to whether it's trade or whatever. Uh, I, I, no, I don't see China as a model. It can't be replicated anywhere in Africa. I just don't see, I don't know. I take issue there, but anyway, Toyan, are you there? I think we're out of yes, time. Yes. I, I have to and, get running. Yes, and this has been, ex in fact, I'm looking at the chat. Let me quickly read a few comments and maybe you, you, if you are able to take a, a question or two before sure. you have to go. Okay. Is that okay? Good. So sure. Ms. Sher Ms. Sherry Jefferson says, I think when America speaks to other countries, they speak as the authority and you know, the co other country is not the authority. We have to have mutual respect for all countries. We are all different, but in the whole scheme of things, we want the same thing. Wow. Um, well, what, on, one, way, one way I will okay, agree with the professor in China is uh, exactly that, what this person was just saying, you know. An African head of state comes here, they're not going to see President Trump, they're not going to see President Biden, Obama, etc. You know, they have to be seen in tranches. Whereas they go to China, they get an audience, they get treated properly. That, that's mm. one way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with John, and I agree, I agree with John, and I agree with Sherry and what she's saying. Um, that uh, the United States, when it comes to that, is actually acting as the authority and giving directions on how things should be rather than uh, listening. That's mm. for sure. Wow. It, uh, for me, this conversation today, in my mind, I think it's the beginning of what the future, of creating a better future in terms of you, um, Africa, 
US relations? I don't think there's any, any answer yet, no. but I think what Professor is bringing and shedding to light. And, and in fact, when I read his book, I told him, I said it felt like a therapy because he captured the essence of what, it, what we as Africans have felt but we've not had places where we could voice our own um, stories or, or, or what we have experienced as a collective. So his book, I think it's probably the first book that really grounded this idea that Africans have I ideas and a way of being that has been disrupted and continues to be disrupted by the world and probably going into the future, first of all, Africans need to um, embrace their identity. I think that was one thing that book in a subtle way did is that Africans need not apologize for being Africans anymore. Um, Africans need to be okay be, by being who they are, their mm -hmm. passions, their cultures, their food, like spices, Art, art, expression, right? Mannerism. I remember working in corporate. One of my leaders, who was a very good friend, and we're very frank. I learned that way. You know, I, I realized I used my hands so much, <laughs> right? And he would <laughs> smack my hands like you're you're pointing at me. <laughs> so I quickly learned how to put my hands down in meetings, because yeah. in meetings. Being expressive was not American. <laughs> you had to, you know, only your mouth should move. You should be stoic and, you know, your words are the only things that need to be seen or heard in this room, not your body. But we as Africans, you see us in music, in art, in sports, our DNA makeup looks different. I think what that was, that, that was what uh, Professor's book did. And I, I really want to encourage him because I had to bring him in and he was like, why are you? I was like, you, we, you need to, this is a new novel concept in a way um, of, of then messaging to the world, understand us for who we are, don't try to change us. That was the key. And I, I thank, yes, please. No, I agree with you completely. I agree. And especially now at this time in 2021, uh, the art, the music, the culture, the movies, the uh, uh, and 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 the continent itself is still blessed with billions and trillions of dollars of natural resources. Young people, there is so much going on in the continent, and it's the time. And yes, make a new way of looking and accepting ourselves, our Africans, as what they are and how they are, without any apologies. I think it's the right time to push that kind of message. I agree completely. Right, and, and I think also each African almost has to go through their own um, identity or therapy where, because our creativity is tied to our identity. Sure. Because the moment your identity is corrupted, your creativity and how you express and show up to the world is also impacted, whether you like it or not. And for me, I had to wrestle and settle with that. And that's why I can do this meaningful work right here in the US. And I say in a way, I'm mainstreaming the idea of Africa in business, which I have never seen anybody do before. Sometimes it's like a new space of creating this awareness and this embrace of Africa within business, not corruption, not war, not hungry, not charity, which is how we've been portrayed. We have a place in business. And I think I want to encourage as many Africans as possible, you have permission to assert yourself, right? I think not with retreat because the space you might find yourself with, whether in corporate or politics, might try to push you into a box that you don't belong in. Our expression, our creativity deserves a place in the world. This is the time for Africa to show the world what being African really means in its authentic form. And that's what I would just say. And, um, and, and that's why, that's what I've had to embrace. I've had to go through my own journey of the immigrant story. But then when my dad passed about six years ago, something, something 
three said in my mind, it was almost like I had forgotten who I was. Mm-hmm. And then when I went back to the continent and I heard the stories of the community, I wrote a mini biography of my dad. I was like, wait a minute. I know who I am. My father told me who I am. I come from a great man. I need to rediscover my identity as an African. And I need to start showing up in the world as such. Of course, understanding what it means within the American concept, you know, blending it well, that it's digestible and presenting things that are digestible by both culture. And hopefully this platform is, 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 is presenting what I, I hope is the next future. It's, it's embracing, it's collective, it's exciting, it's welcoming of diverse voices and opinions. So maybe I, I wasn't planning to give a speech, but <laughs> that's well, you I did. <laughs> I'll, I'll just close with this because, uh, you know, I, I'm this white guy from 70 miles south of the professor's university there in Minnesota. And I've been asked for decades, why Africa? Why Africa? Why Africa? You know, I've lived all over the world. I've traveled all over the world. And let's just get right down to it. Africa is the most cool place. And yeah, you don't have to apologize or explain anything just Hmm. everything you just said it's exciting oh thank you so much ah yeah okay thank you that's a good i have to to get running here yes thank you so much that's a good way to start us to stop today tomorrow please be back we're going more deeper into technical expertise thank you mr john mr daniel such an honor we need to continue this conversation um, Professor Mbele, you see what I'm saying? You have work to do, sir. <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you, oh, thank you so mm-hmm. much. That's it, everybody. Thank We're going to move the. Qu- yes, yes. We're going to start moving the. Qu- um, I'm sorry because of time. On Friday, though, I'm I'm changing the agenda. We're going to give a bit, about 20 good minutes. I hope um, for Friday, m- more dialogue, more engagement. I really want to. I um, appreciate people's time. I know there are so many conversations that people want to have and hopefully we can create more spaces that is not just once a year that people can learn and grow together. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a wrap for today and see you bright and early tomorrow. Thank you also to Mr. Komi that shared early in the morning. This is such a fantastic engagement. We, we have the questions. Your question is not going anywhere. We're going to be moving it to the platform and we can continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you you so much. much. God bless you. Thank Thank you. you, Bye-bye. Same to you.